having looked over some of the comments from the previous video, I saw a lot of people bringing up the same point, and I have to agree with it. Essentially, that point was, in Bionicle Generation 1, the Toa Mata had room to grow, right? They looked complete out of the box on their own, but the Toa Nuva felt like an upgrade because they were identifiably an upgrade. And this is kind of a point that I raised in the video itself, but others definitely made it a little more concise. In Generation 2 Bionicle, we didn't have the same luxury, and that kind of makes sense because for Bionicle Generation 2, I think to really start off with a bang, it needed to have Toa Mata equivalent characters that, for all intents and purposes, did feel like an upgrade to what came before. Otherwise, what would be the point of buying those sets? However, at the same time, where do you go from there? By taking away room to grow, by starting off with what you were essentially calling masters, where do you go from beyond that, right? I thought of what feels like an interesting concept because it's not anything that was really explored before in Bionicle. I guess kind of, we'll get to it. What if instead we had gotten the Toa Masters and then the next form of these characters wasn't an upgrade, but a downgrade. And I know that this sounds really weird, and I don't necessarily think it could work on its own. But hear me out. So in 2005, we were introduced to the Toa Hordika, which in a lot of ways, in some ways, I guess, in the story, this is an upgrade, but it's also a downgrade, right? Because in some sense, at least in terms of lore, these characters are corrupted, right? For lack of a better term. And obviously we know that later on down the line, these Toa would become Turaga, the Turaga that we all knew and loved back in 2001. Now I'm not necessarily saying that the Toa Mata or Toa Masters needed to become Turaga, no. But I thought it would have been interesting and I think it would have raised the stakes if maybe the Toa Masters had their power stolen siphoned from them and thus you know in the second wave or maybe in the second year we were essentially in following along the footsteps of these once toa masters now toa novice what do you want to call them you know i don't know uh but now these lesser toa and sort of following them along their journey to regain the power they once had and at the same time i think about how the skeleton sets a lot of people had issues with them I'm not really one of them. Like, I could make some gripes about specific skeleton sets, but I'm actually one of the people that did like the idea of the skull villains. Idea being the key word there. Execution definitely could have been done better. And so it made me think that what if the goal of these skull villains was to no longer be skull villains, right? To, to gain some kind of power. Maybe they were cursed on this island and were stuck there for eternity, right? They didn't get to follow through with their, um, uh, I don't even know what to call it. I'm running out of words, right? But the, the life of a Toa is like a Matoran to a Toa to a Turaga. And maybe these Skull villains were once Toa in their own right. And instead of becoming Turaga, they were corrupted to stay in this sort of Toa form indefinitely. And over time, you know, their power was siphoned. I don't know. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. It's kind of a silly concept. And I'm probably not explaining it as well as I could. But long story short, what were once Toa became these Skull villains over time, over corruption, over curse, or whatever the case may be, right? And so my thought was, maybe the Skull villains succeed in their uh, uh, goal, in, in their whatever they're doing in the background. The Toa Masters are dealing with the Skull Spiders and the Lord of Skull Spiders, which is a mess in its own right, but that's a separate video. And probably a video coming up soon, actually, now I think about it. But <laughs> point being, while all this is going on, maybe the Skull villains are taking advantage of the Toa sort of expending their power. Maybe, in fact, the Skull Spiders and even the Lord of Skull Spiders are sort of a proxy for the Skull villains in general. Maybe, in essence, the Spiders aren't much of a threat on their own. Like, we we know that. The Toa have no problem really dealing with them handily. Um, but maybe that's kind of the point, right? What if 
the skull spiders are sort i'm coming up with this right now by the way i want to make this very clear but what if the skull spiders are a siphon in their own way so that the toa expending their power on these skull spiders is actually absorbing that power and siphoning it back to the skull villains how that works i don't know and that's not for me to decide right but the point still stands that i think it'd be a really fascinating idea that by trying to battle these skull spiders it's sort of the toa's undoing in a lot of ways because it is sort of giving power to these skull villains enough to make them strong enough to deal with the toa in a way or to become a formidable foe to the toa and then the skull villains sort of unleash their power when they recognize okay the toa don't have as much power as they think they do right now and so now's our time now's our chance to try and take over this island to to gain their power so maybe we can break free of this curse whatever the case may be almost like a sympathetic villain in a lot of ways too because they don't necessarily want to harm the toa maybe i don't know but they do want to take that power uh to to break free of their curse i don't know anyway it's just a thought but the idea is that in that second wave maybe we have these diminished form of toa now obviously there's a problem with this right how do you sell a lesser form of a toy that came out the year before i don't know exactly like lego could do it they're pretty intelligent uh, and maybe maybe they couldn't i don't know they couldn't sell the toa uniters well enough um but the idea i think is solid in this way you have a sort of buffer between the toa masters and the uniters in that the the masters now have to sort of fight back in their diminished form to to gain their power back maybe more maybe that's how they transform into uniters i don't know I still think it's a really interesting concept. I've toyed around with all kinds of ideas when it comes to Generation 2, how the Toa could in some way sort of fight the environment again in the form of uh, beasts, but not the beasts that we got, rather beasts that sort of exist on the island already. That's a separate video probably on its own. But one of the problems I had with Generation 2 as it was sold to us was a lack of what I called consistency. And what I meant by that is that from between forms, right, some of the Toa are very identifiably the same as the previous year. However, some change things up uh, quite a lot, right? Uh, obviously, Kopaka and Onua lose a lot of their gold. They still have a little bit of it. Um, obviously, Onua has gold printing, of course, but you know, you've got sets that trade out secondary colors for different secondary colors, which kind of made it feel like lego was indecisive in a lot of ways whether or not you liked the changes that's not the point right but the the fact of the matter is it ended up feeling as i mentioned in the previous video both sort of samey in the fact that each uniter felt very similar to each other aesthetically on a shelf etc and um at the same time each one shoehorned in a lot of metallic colors a lot of secondary and even tertiary colors a lot of transparent colors where it started to feel like a muddled mess and i get it to a degree i get what lego was trying to do hero factory didn't do this to this degree and the star wars sets that were out at the same time were all fairly muted in their color schemes not all of them you know but for the most part a lot more browns and grays and blacks and things going on as is the nature of that universe and so really wanting bionicle to stand out is not a crime in and of itself but it's it stood out in a way that kind of felt like color vomit in a lot of ways, design vomit. Um, and I think that that's unfortunate because there is a lot to love, even in the Uniter line as well. A lot of little ideas here and there where it's like, I can see what they were doing, but they just didn't commit enough. They just wasn't consistent enough. And as much as I like the or appreciate some of the color changes, I really appreciate orange with Gally's, um dark azure but at the same time i like yellow with the dark azure so you know i can appreciate both the former and the latter still getting ahead of myself at the end of the day i think that there was still a lot left on the table a lot of room left but we were seeing the writing on the wall not just for bionicle but ccbs in general lego was sort of going away from it abandoning it abandoning it in a lot of ways I think it's unfortunate. Bionicle kind of came at a time, Generation 2, came at a time that was kind of too late for itself, which is really unfortunate. But it, it's 
you know, you don't control the market. You don't control what else is out there, what you're competing with. And honestly, I, I kind of think in some ways with the resurgence of Pokemon in around 2017 with Pokemon Go, whenever that came out exactly, I don't remember, but around that time, right? I really think that had Bionicle sort of held off a little bit, spent a little more time cooking, if you will, and came out around the same time, it could have maybe jumped on that bandwagon a little bit if it had played to the strengths of the Pokemon franchise in much the same way as it did in the first generation. Would it have been the same? I don't know how. I can't speak to that, obviously. That's not the reality we live in. But when Bionicle Generation 1 came around, it was lightning in a bottle. It was the perfect toy at the perfect time against the perfect market. Um, and, you know, it was the age kind of before the internet, right before the internet, right? And so it's much harder to sell a toy today than it was back then. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we got what we got, but I think that there is a lot here worth exploring at the very least or worth thinking about. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it, I think, for the video. Before I end the video, I just want to showcase, too, that because I showed off uh, uh, a knockoff set that I got recently in the mail, I wanted to showcase two things. A, um, you can build Liwa Uniter's leg in purely bright green here. I like the little bit of lime green there to kind of throw things up. Or, of course, you could change that out for Keat Orange, which I think would be better. The foot, if you're not aware, by the way, does come in bright green. It actually comes in, I think, the... Either the Green Lantern set, I think it's the Green Lantern set from CCBS, so a little bit more obscure, but you can get that piece. Uh, should have been used in Bionicle 2. Um, but yeah, I think that's a little bit too much bright green, but at least you get the idea. And of course, the eye can be changed out for lime green. But yeah, if you bought that set, you get both the Borok eye and the Vorox or Scrawl shell. And the other thing I guess I'll show off while I'm showing off the Scrawl shell is I made a little Rahi for 2009 Bionicle, just sort of featuring that piece, also featuring the double socket that came out in 2009 with the axles and pinholes off of the side of it. Very wonderful piece, unfortunately, plagued by the fact that uh, it's fragile. Anyway, so that's it for this one. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe. It helps the channel out tremendously. And of course, um, I will see you all in the next one. Take care.